Good morning, good afternoon, good evening internet, and welcome back to my YouTube channel, Economical Rides. Join us today for the ride to Alto de Velafique. We also discuss a possible way to improve the rear ride quality of your Meteor 350 and we introduce a new segment, Economical History. So, let's go. So as we ride up to Alto de Velafique, let me tell you about a little trick which I've just tried and which was suggested by two people in the comments to my last video and sorry I don't have your names off the top of my head but I will put your names up on the screen so thank you for the suggestion. Anyway yeah it was a suggestion to improve the ride quality at the rear of the Meteor without actually uh, buying new shocks. So these two people mentioned in the comments that actually they've added two clicks of preload to the rear spring damper units and that that had improved comfort for them. Now uh, I'm just going to have to open the visor because it's very hot and I'm suffocating so it might get windy so bear with me. So yeah, um, adding preload, improving the ride comfort. Sounded a bit bizarre, but there were two people who independently suggested that we should try it because they've done it and they feel an improvement. So before I came out for this ride today, I thought, right, I'll give that a quick try and uh, try and get a verdict on whether I think that's helped or not. So the good news is, um, I was able to do it, I was able to adjust the uh, preload with the Royal Enfield Supply Toolkit just using their C-spanner and the uh, extension handle and the first click up was, didn't require a lot of effort the second click obviously a bit more because you're compressing the spring more and more but anyway I was able to do it with the uh, onboard toolkit so that was excellent and I felt like a proper mechanic because it just worked. Well, I say a proper mechanic, you know, without scratching the paint and leaving greasy paw prints everywhere. So, yeah, so I set the preload up to two clicks because basically, I, certainly on my bike, it was on the very lowest setting uh, from the factory. So you're right at the bottom on the preload. So I went up two clicks and we set off. Now, as luck would have it, the road that brings me out here it's actually one of the bumpier roads we have around here. It's a terribly bumpy surface. So it was a good opportunity to see whether it's made any difference. Well, thank you to those two people. Because, I'll tell you what, it has made a difference. Um, initially I was thinking, oh, it's probably a placebo. You know, subconsciously you're feeling an improvement because you know that you've done something that could possibly improve it. But, I have to say, no. And I'll tell you for why, because previously with this bike, um, the front was always pretty stiff, but you always felt like the rear was a lot stiffer than the front, a lot harsher. Now since I've gone up to on the preload, I would say now that the front and the rear feel about the same in terms of ride quality. So the rear is no longer harder than the front, it feels as hard as the front. So it's not going to be plush, but I think it's a step in the right direction. And any little, you know, additional comfort you can get without spending money on accessories, it's got to be a good thing. So, based on my experience, I would say, give it a go. Now, just to give you some kind of uh, idea, 
with all my gear on I probably weigh about 75 76 kilos so if you're a lot heavier than that you might want to go up a bit or maybe you don't even have the issue I mean that could also be the case but anyway um, so say 75 kilos with my gear on so why would adding preload improve the ride quality well I do have a theory on that now I think at 75 kilos it's unlikely 75 kilos without a pillion without any luggage I think it's unlikely that I would be uh, bottoming out the suspension when it's on its lowest preload setting I, I don't think I'm heavy enough to do that on my own so I don't think it's that so the only thing I can think it is and I always did suspect that the initial part of the spring is very stiff for whatever reason it always felt as though the suspension only really started to work when it got a real whack then you could feel it doing something but on like smaller little bumps and jiggles it was doing nothing that's what it felt like so I always suspected that maybe the initial part of the spring is very very stiff for whatever reason so if you think that's the case, if that is the case, then by adding preload, you're compressing that initial part of the spring. You're kind of taking it out of the game. So you're pushing it, pushing it, pushing it, and then the spring is sat, possibly. It's only a theory, I'm not a suspension expert. The spring might actually be sat, poised, on the next part of the spring, which has got a bit more give. So by adding preload, you're taking out that really hard part and you're settling the suspension just where the spring starts to feel happy to start moving with less forces going through it. That's the theory. I don't know if it's true or not, as I say, but so certainly I feel that the front and the rear now are about equal. So I think there has been a, an improvement. So there you go. Give that a try. Before you spend a lot of money on new shots I think ultimately to get a, a nice ride you probably will be looking at new shots but then you'll probably start thinking the front rides terribly so then you'll be thinking about doing something to the forks as well so the way I've got it set up now with um, two clicks of preload for my 75 kilos it seems to be working really well not comfortable by any means but certainly improved It's not too bad out here today as you can see I've got my uh, super light gear on I've just got some Under Armour and a t-shirt today because uh, even my mesh jacket when it's uh, 35 degrees is too sweaty so uh, I'm fairly comfortable dressed as I am which is nice it's probably about 35 degrees again today So I won't be showing you all of this road if you want to see a bit more of this road you need to check out my two recent videos um, of an evening ride with a Harley Davidson Road King on Norman on Himalayan where I actually uh, feature coming down this road and you get to see a bit more of it this video is not going to be a terribly long one so yeah you won't get to see all of this road but it is a lovely road and um, today I'm just going to ride up it and then come back down it because if I go down the other side of the mountain it's a very long route to get me home and I don't have a lot of time today so I hope you're all well I hope you're all getting some riding in and uh, yeah why don't we go straight over now to my new feature on the channel um, it's not going to be that regular but from time to time we'll do it uh, a new feature called economical history now don't worry this isn't where you can buy a Henry VIII at a 20% discount it's nothing like that it's where I tell you about some of the bikes I've had and some of my biking stories in my mischievous youth and at other ages where I probably should have known better and um, yeah talk about some of my old bikes and what I got up to with them so here we go economical history well 
today we're going to be talking about my first big bike, the first bike I got after I passed my test when I was 17 years old. Um, I went out and bought a Suzuki GSX 250E. Not a very um, trendy bike. Um, the RDs and the um, X7s, the two strokes, they were kind of the sportier bikes, but uh, I got this one for a very good price. I think it was a 1984 model, which I bought in 1987. So it was practically brand new by my standards, and it was dirt cheap. Now there was a reason why it was dirt cheap, as you'll come to find out. Probably multiple reasons, but I should have maybe got suspicious, because I saw, I saw an advert in, in the local newspaper, and I went to look at this bike. And I should have been suspicious, because it was being sold from a scrap yard. So I think basically this scrap dude he had a bit of a sideline when he when he got a damaged bike in he'd probably been more or less written off or mildly written off. He probably set about trying to repair them and selling them, you know, onto punters like myself. Well anyway, I bought this bike and I was fairly happy with it, it was alright and it was you know, my first big bike, so I was quite proud of it. So it was a it's a twin cylinder, 250. And a slightly unique feature of it was it had dual overhead cams and eight valves. So it had four valve per cylinder heads on it, which made it fairly good for a four stroke 250. I think it was supposed to do about 85 miles an hour. So I had this bike and had a few foibles. Now, one of the foibles was at any speed over 60 miles an hour, it used to get into a massive tank slap where it was like you were towing a caravan in a crosswind or something. The whole, from, the, from the headstock backwards, the whole bike would start swaying about. So, I suspect maybe the chassis geometry was no longer OEM. Um, so there was that. And another little foible it had was a sticky clutch. Now it was sticky, it was a weird one because I'd put lots of oil down the cable and everything. It was basically the cable would stick, but that, it probably had a kink in it somewhere. Again, might have been accident damage that put a kink in it. So anyway, sometimes you would let the clutch out, and you would let the clutch out, and then you'd have the clutch all the way out, but the, the lever was still like three millimetres towards you. It, it wouldn't ping back on its own. So then you had to pull the clutch in, put it in neutral, push the clutch all the way out, push the lever all the way out so that the cable was fully in and try again and then usually it would, uh, it would work. So anyway, at this time I was 17 and I used to take my mate uh, to sixth floor, I used to pick him up on the bike and take him home. And then shortly after I got the bike, obviously I was showing off a bit, so I dropped him off. He was still at the bottom of the driveway, in the road. And I said, right, I'm going to give you that a racing start. You watch this. You watch this. So, so I've got the clutch in, got first gear. I've got all the revs on, like the valves are bouncing. You know, I've got all the revs on. I'm lent right over the handlebar, sort of speedway of style. So, you know, I'm going to keep the front down. This is going to be an awesome start, awesome getaway. So there I am, I've got all the revs on, I'm in gear. I'm gradually letting the clutch, letting the clutch, letting the clutch. And then I realise the clutch is all the way out. I've got my hand off the lever now and nothing's happening. And I thought, oh, the cable's stuck again. So I was just literally about to pull the clutch in. I had my fingers on the clutch and it went ping. And the last little bit of the clutch cable suddenly came out and the clutch engaged all at once. And yeah, my GSX 250E did a somersault on the spot and I ended up with it on top of me. So there you go. Oh, that was good timing. Look, we've arrived at the top. So this is the top of Alto Velifique. So here we are again. At the top of Alto de Velifique. Here are loads of stickers. And just there, there's an economical rides one, would you believe? Which uh, I put there in that previous video that I mentioned, or those two videos, it was a two-part video. So here's Buddy, looking excellent. Bit of a hazy day today. But we'll just have a quick look at the view from up here.
Right, so that was Alto de Velafique. Let's turn around and go home. So I hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, economical history. The uh, GSX 250E went on to have a fairly long life. There wasn't really any damage um, when I looped it, other than I think one of the silencers was scratched. I might have knocked an indicator off, I think I might have gone to the scrapyard for an indicator. But yeah, overall it, was, it wasn't really a big deal, and I was fine fortunately. I had no damage at all. But I certainly didn't do that again. But the clutch was like that uh, for as long as I had the bike. I mean, I never got it sorted. Because <laughs> in those days you didn't bother, you just learned, learned to live with these things. Um, yeah, and, and it, it was uh, that bike did have quite a long lifespan because after sixth form, when I, when I had to go to university, it was going to be four and a half hours away from where my parents lived. So I really needed a car for moving my stuff in and out of lodgings uh, every holiday. So my parents helped me to buy a car, or bought a car for me basically, but as part of the deal, I agreed that I would leave the Suzuki for my dad and he could ride it to work. So that's what we did. I got a car to go to university. And my dad used to ride the Suzuki to work from time to time. And uh, yeah, that went well for a while, but then one day he crashed in the wet at a roundabout and broke his hand. And then I think uh, they decided it was time to get rid of that bike and let someone else have it. So I don't know exactly who ended up buying it, but uh, I'm sure they had their fun with it. I hope you enjoyed that little video, it's just a short one for you today. I just fancy going out for a ride and I didn't have a video so I thought I'd bring you along. And then the thing with the preload on the shocks came up so I thought we'd give that a go at the same time. So thank you to you two people, your names will be on the screen here, um, for that suggestion, that was very helpful. And I, I do recommend it to anybody, it doesn't cost you anything, it's fairly easy to do. You can do it with the uh, onboard toolkit, the C-spanner with the uh, extension handle that the Royal Enfield supply with the bike. Uh, two clicks on the preload see how you feel I feel like the front and the rear now are about the same whereas before the rear was definitely significantly harder than the front so thank you for those uh, suggestions and hope you enjoyed this video I hope you enjoyed a little bit of economical history the GSX 250e was one of many bikes I've owned and that was the bike that I had my first motorcycling disaster with as described um, and I'll see what, uh, what other uh, memories I can conjure for future videos for further uh, economical history segments so if you enjoyed this video in any way please give me a like hit the old thumbs up that really helps my video to get recommended by the YouTube algorithm which means more and more people will find it which is better for me obviously and subscribe if you haven't already I do a video per week sometimes two Thank you very much for watching. I'm off home now to get Ruby a sausage. Bye bye. So Ruby, apparently adding preload makes things softer. What's that? Your sausages must have a lot of preload because they're so soft. Hmm, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, you're right, it is sausage time. So today's sausages are from Cousin Georgie, because Cousin Georgie sent you a lot of sausage money and we're still working our way through it. Yes, we are. So, here you go. <laughs> sausage. <laughs> oh, it tastes better from the floor. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, Georgie. Sausages. <laughs>